not saying that. Okay. <laughs> uh, sharks with laser beams on their heads. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of a little bit of a progression here. It's working out really nicely because I get to sort of, Ken and Mike have explained a lot of things already for me. Um, so we're going to, unfortunately, they saved me a little bit of time here too. Uh, but uh, Mike Kiefer yesterday had this sort of challenge of explaining something before he explained what he did. And I kind of have the same thing. I want to make sure that we're all sort of, I'm going to do a little like LiDAR one-on-one -on -one before we get too far into what we can do with LiDAR and what we did in this case with it. So just so you sort of understand what's going on. And, and so we got a, we have this press kit from our, uh, from our, Sort of media relations person this year, or whatever that title is. Uh, what's her? What's her? Gina. What's her title? She yes, the communications director for Northern Research Station, and the rest of the Forest Service got this sort of packet of about the, the 2017 fire season. Okay, and you know, as, as a scientist and as somebody that has you know a limited amount of land management experience when I was very young. Uh, I, I do like to look at these things and try to figure out where does my science fit into this? Like, how do I fit? And I fit with this. I do fuels. I do fuels. I've always been interested in fuels because I do remote sensing. And uh, remote sensing and fuels are sort of synonymous. And, and, and so we've sort of come to this point where the, the narrative is kind of that. And I, I love this. Sarah McCaffrey uh, wrote a really cool thing last week. It came out last week that like, this narrative of Wu. Like, how much research is really behind that stuff? You know, we, but this is a narrative, and one of the narratives for this year has been this landscapes with heavy fuels. And so, sort of like, how, what does that even really mean to some people? And I don't know. Anyway, so I was happy to see that some of my work was kind of, what we're doing is kind of interesting in that way. And it's never really been, you know, the most difficult thing to justify. Um, there was a GAO report that uh, has been, the guy's name that wrote was Gord. And, uh, he wrote it, and it was just sort of this damning thing about the Forest Service, you know, or about our fault policy that you know we're spending 300 million a year if it doesn't get sucked into fire suppression. 300 million dollars a year is allocated to fuels reduction, and there's basically there was basically at that time really no supporting evidence that anything that we were doing was really making that much of an impact at all. And I mean, so Ken showed very clearly uh, that in the pine barrens. The, the consumption of fuel it isn't really that variable in the understory, so we're always sort of reducing fuels by some sort of certain percentage. But we also know that for surface fuels, that you know, there's, they're falling back down at a certain rate too. So that rate in minus decomposition, at some point it ends up being that every five years there's pretty much you're back to normal for a prescribed fire. So how much of an impact are you actually having with that? So this questions get a little bit more. There, it's a little bit more. It's a little deeper than that, right? So yeah, we're reducing fuels, but how effective are we at doing that? Or where should we put our fuels treatments? If we're not really affecting the canopy, are we really doing anything? You know, those kind of questions. And you know, Mike sort of has taken that on now to look at how, you know, how can we affect the canopy? How can we cause mortality in the overstory using fire? And it's really not always the best idea to do that either. Um, you know, fire isn't necessarily the best tool for, for, for doing that, but so there's, anyway, this fuels question and the ecology of fuels and things like that, it's a really interesting thing to me. And it's, anyway, so that's where this is also coming from, this sort of background in my head. And so when I think about fuels, I think about what kind of fuels are they and how, how much fuel is there, okay? And through the years, and from what you just saw with Mike, uh, you know, he gave a pretty good uh, Landsat primer there, you know. We have a lot of satellites to do spectral reflectance data collection at various resolutions. You know, Landsat sort of that's that's what everybody thinks about. It's been the standard for 30 years, and there's been several satellites with consistent data. That data set is, is you know a national treasure, really. Um, and and there's other satellites that are starting to get higher and higher resolution with more and more spectral bands, so we can look at different parts of the spectrum at, um, of re of reflectance. And so from that. You know, there's been a million papers that have showed that we can say that, okay, this is pitch pine forest, this is oak forest, or this is this X, Y, Z. We're pretty good at telling what kind of fuel there is, you know, from a just sort of a classification standpoint. And that's really what land fire does, right? Land fire maps the, the nation 
And, and I mean, Landfire uses some pretty sophisticated models to, to come up with their, uh, their classification of fuels across the country, but pretty good at that. We can, I can tell you probably what kind of fuel you have at pretty high resolution. And I probably can do it for the last 30 years and look at changes. And, and so it's interesting, but that's, it's sort of a different question. You know, that, that, that's, that question is pretty well resolved. Uh, the question that's not resolved is how do we measure fuels across landscapes? Um, and, and Mike demonstrated that really nicely with, you know, he really has gone to like a thousand plots in the Pine Barrens over the years. And, you know, the spatial area that he's sampled has been, you know, pretty much, you know, a, a millionth of the, of the actual land area, you know, out there. And I know that's it's kind of a, it's, it's, it's a silly argument a little bit, but, you know, this, in, in our field where spatial, um, patterning makes so much of a, of a difference. A statistical uh, approach to that, you know, like a plot-based approach, is, is, is a little bit inadequate, right? Because we're not, we need a description of where the fuels are, how much there are, and how does that vary with topography or with weather patterns. You know, we saw that yesterday. Those things matter here. You can't just do some like a statistical extrapolation. So this problem of how much fuel and where it is spatially <laughs> Uh, it's a really interesting thing, and and it also it's a little bit more interesting because if you think of uh, like like fuel cover or, or uh, fuel type from the previous slide, it's really a two dimensional problem. You know, forest we, we can classify forest in two dimensions, but fuels we're looking at three dimensions. So how do we how do we make the forest into like a Rubik's cube and tell you that okay down on the, on the ground I have these shrubs here and over here I don't have any shrubs. I have a mid story here story here, no canopy here, and how do we kind of like describe that gappiness and stuff like that? I mean, it's a, it'd be awesome if we could do that, right? But like, there's really not a good way to do it. Um, and it's really this idea of, that I've been interested in, and in, in this, is, this is coming from Jersey, uh, ground fires, you know, we got that, we're good. Ground fires are fine. We can handle that, we burn it in, no big deal. Where do we run into our problems? Our sort of public safety problems, our firefighter problems? This is, I'm just giving you some context of where my head was, you know, as a land manager. I was worried about crowd fires, um, you know, and, and being in military installation in the Pine Barrens, you know, we're notorious for losing crowd fires and, and sort of directing them to retirement communities. <laughs> so, so it was always to me was like, how do we reduce that risk? Um, and ecologically in the Pine Barrens, you know, more Variability is just the answer. There's really no, where we're at, like we just need more variability. I don't care, like whatever, like there's no crowd over there, that's good. Uh, we, we need to, to lose that. So I was always interested in sort of how we measure crown bulk density, right? So does anybody know how you measure canopy bulk density? Basically, what is the volume of fuel in a three-dimensional space? Can anybody tell me how to do that? Well, how do we measure biomass? Or how do we estimate biomass, I should say? Okay, so, yeah, right. We use like a, some other like ancillary variable to, to predict it. Okay. So in a lot of cases, we can estimate canopy bulk density. Folks have gone out and like Mike did, like he measured all the diameters of the trees, so if they die or not. Some people will go out, they'll cut these trees down, and they will uh, they'll basically run a tape. We've done this, and you'll basically just dissect the tree, and you'll know spatially where all the fuel was on this tree, and you relate it back to something you can measure on the ground. We always measure diameter, right? Because it's easy, it's right there, and height, uh, or whatever you want to try to do. Uh, and in some cases, those models work really nice. And uh, I mean, we this is just a, a representation, but we, we have models to predict canopy bulk density in pitch pine plots uh, very well. I mean, I'm, like we can tell you how many hundred hour fuels there are in a plot, like with a R squared of 0.87, if you know what the diameters of the trees are. I mean, really good. And again, plot based though, right? The problem with pitch pine, and this is somewhat of a unique problem, is that it, at the point like they re sprouts. And so, even though the trees haven't changed physically, I mean, if we're going to go measure diameter of pitch pine before a fire and then after a fire, I mean, it's still the same diameter, but we go from like a just gnarly old, you know, huge canopy, and then we have these epicormic re sprouts popping out. And we end up with like a, a, a pipe cleaner tree. And so, so it's really kind of a, not a great place to study this stuff because the canopy itself is dynamic even though the density of trees or the, the, the trees themselves aren't changing in what we're measuring. 
And so we end up with like what the model would have said for the same tree back here. It's still saying for this tree here, but the reality is that that tree is completely changed. So it's just sort of another, it's actually kind of a neat little problem in the high variance. So and this, and there's, there's this form of active remote sensing. There's several forms of active remote sensing that show some potential. And after being, you're going out to touch whatever you're looking at, your remote sensing. So if I was doing passive remote sensing of you guys right now, I would just take a picture. Like the, I'm just measuring the reflectance of light back from you guys. Active remote sensing, I might like poke you with a pole or something. That's how far you are. LiDAR just sort of pokes everything with a pole. And it's simple pro properties of the speed of light. So with LiDAR, we have a sensor that emits a pulse of light. It hits a target over there or wherever, and it bounces back. And if we just take that time to do that, divided by two, we end up with the distance to the target because we know the speed of light. It's a fixed thing. And you know, really, the advances in this are in sort of modern computing and like miniaturization of things and our ability to do things super fast. And so if you take that principle, just that speed of light principle, and you're able to send that light out, and you can do it you know, like 250,000 times a second, and you can spin that around, and you can hook it up to a you know, military-grade GPS, you do pretty crazy things. And so, so this has really been, LiDAR applications of forestry have, have been for the past, uh, I'd say 15 years. 15 years ago, we, took, we would take a plane, Ross Nelson from NASA was one of the first people to do this with LiDAR. It was just this serendipitous thing that I met him. But he would strap a, uh, a, a ship's LiDAR or laser, which would tell the, the ship how close to the dock it was. So it's just this very like, industrial sensor. And he would strap it on the bottom of helicopters and fly around with it and, tra and do transects of the forest. And Maris, when Maris was the state fireworks in New Jersey, we uh, used one of the bells and we strapped that instrument on the bottom of the helicopter and we flew it. I think 140 transects across the New Jersey Pine Barrens. It took us like five days of flying to do that. Uh, so very, you know, and we ended up with just this profile of what the tree heights were. And, and, that, and it's, it's kind of crazy what we can do now with it. I mean, you can go and buy a TLS, a terrestrial laser, and you can just sit here and scan this whole room and for like $10,000 now. I mean, it's just crazy. We have one that you can walk around the woods with and um, I mean, it just, it just, it's amazing. So I think this will be on your cell phone in the next four or five years. So I, I think it's, it's really gonna go that way. Uh, anyway, so we, we put these things in an aircraft. That's what, that's what we're, we're getting with, and that's what this talk is sort of focusing on. And so I wanted to just talk about this idea of LiDAR and how it works sort of statistically. Uh, so a single letter return in the forest tells me Nothing, right? Like, I'll, if I just shoot a laser beam over there at one little spot, and it just says, "Okay, there's an X Y Z coordinate," right? So your lat long and then your Z is above the surface. Uh, but when we have like a thousand of them within like a box, then we know something. Then we can start to use statistics to describe that distribution of returns. So, I like this Rubik's cube analysis, and it's kind of like the. If you think back to what Mike talked about yesterday, what was the kind of model that well, there was the box model was the simplest. And what was the model that used just box models? Eulerian, right? So it was just a bunch of box models sort of stacked and, and like, like a Rubik's Cube. So if we divide the forest into this Rubik's Cube using just sort of like, like GIS, and we start grouping all of these random returns that mean nothing by themselves, right? That doesn't mean anything by itself. We can start to like describe the canopy of the forest using statistics. And that comes back to this idea of like using the, the diameter of a tree to tell you about a variable of interest, you know, if you want to predict biomass or something like that. We can use these statistics that are consistent across the entire landscape to then do the same kind of thing. Yeah. So just a couple of examples of like what the what this distribution looks like. And to, it, it's this is maybe the best one for today, but it's fine. So these are just Remember that canopy bulk density slide that I showed you? It was, like, it was a, uh, I'm not going to go the way back. It was just basically, where is the fuel in the canopy, right? This is an example of that. These are just a couple places that I picked uh, right around the size of the experimental forest. So this is just an oak stand. 
And you see that from the LiDAR data, from, from what spatial extent we picked, this is what the distribution of that oak stand is. So you can see the canopy, uh, and then you can see the mid story here. It's pretty nice. This is a pine plantation that's sort of in the back of the Sizzle Experimental Forest. It's a, it's a bunch of weird pitch pine, log wally hybrid things that are left over from the 70s. Uh, but they're still back there, and there's no understory. You know, it's, they're taller than the oak trees that are around. And, and so you can sort of see just sort of different things. You know, we have to deal with everything that we hit somehow. So you can see, like, this is my, this is the uh, old office, the CCC office there. Um, and you can see that that's showing up in here, too. So that's something that we have to sort of treat in our data analysis. We have to take that. We have to basically scrub all those things from the data. We're not going to get into that. So if you can want to go back to this Rubik's Cube idea and also integrate that a little bit with like how we see light and spectra, how we display spectral reflectance data. So this is a, I would say that's a seven by seven mile <coughs> extent. And so it's sort of tilted on its side as a Rubik's Cube with one meter slices through it. Um, and just so that you can sort of see how we're processing this data and kind of thing that we can come up with it. And it's sort of challenging to think about that three-dimensional space, how we're looking at like this thing. And so if you use like a remote sensing data soft software package or something like that, and a lot of us use that, that's what I had used, so that's what I still use to look at this and visualize this data. It, uh, on the right here, this is uh, Burlington County and Camden County, parts of it with the parts that are in the pine barrens. And this is this Rubik's Cube uh, on a 30 by 30 meter basis with one meter slices for that whole, the whole area, so two county area. And up on top here, I'm just using the slice that's closest to the ground. And we'll call that bit one. So it's from zero meters to one meter. And then, I, so I made that be red in my display, right? And then this green one is what I would say is like mid-story, called mid-story. And then this is kind of over ish And then just like a photograph, we can kind of overlay those three things. Uh, and so we can visualize different areas. And so on this map, where it's all red, there's only fuel that's in that lowest bin, okay? And so this is the, this is the pine plants. You can see that very clearly here in this, in this picture. Uh, where, you know, in the areas that are very bright and all white, I don't know what the colors mix anymore. My kids aren't here to tell me. But anyway, you get the idea, right? You, you can look at the landscape, like it's like a picture, but it's not. It's, it's actually, it's, it's like a picture of the heights, you know? So it's kind of, it's a really weird abstract thing. Look, the try to look at this with like, how do we reduce this into one picture, doing like principal components analysis, and it just gets even more, it's just confusing. So, now the really cool thing that I've, that I, like this, so this is really cool for fire, for fire effects and fire management, because like a fire burns through, and Mike just showed us how variable they are from a severity standpoint, but what if we could look at how variable they are from like a height distribution standpoint, where the fuel is in the cannon. And so this is a really good illustration of that. This data was from 2004. What year was this fire, um, the Bass River fire? What year was that, 99? No, the older one. So that fire, this is this fire, this data um, was 10 years after this fire. And you can very clearly see on here the ignition and the ellipse of this fire going from east to west, right? So there it is. And to, the, to the north here, this is the Warren Grove uh, range. And you can have, these are actually individual management units here. And you can see sort of the effects of like the burnout operations. So basically, these roads were black lined, and then this was just lit with the wind. And so you can really see that like spatial heterogeneity of that of the burn ignition patterns and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so anyway, so that's lidar. It, it, we could talk I'll talk to you for days about it if you would like, <laughs> but you don't. Um, so where where can we sort of use this new tool that's sort of online and? LiDAR data is kind of developing faster and faster, and uh, there's many places that we can, we can use it. We can use it for hazard assessment for our pre-decision making processes. Uh, we can use it to look at ecology. I mean, we can use it to, to parameterize ecosystem models, uh, look at habitat, you know, basically like if different birds need a different sort of canopy structure. LiDAR is a really good tool to do that. And um, the cost is really going way down. Anyway, so. 
just real, like a real quick uh, anal like an example of something that we did with this. Uh, we wanted to look at a, a, a suite of burns that happened uh, three years ago now, two years ago now, and it was a thousand acres, a couple thousand acres, lots of different burn units, very high severity fire, low intensity fire, and so very, uh, it was all, you know, prescribed fire, but it was a very variable uh, and heterogeneous app, uh, ignition patterns, helicopter ignition, uh, torch ignition, backing fire uh, lines were in some blocks, so just really weird, awesome fire thing where there was a lot of variability in what happened over the course of two days. And so we wanted to look at, like, is this pre, so we know what fuels are beforehand. Can we predict what these, the severity of the fire is going to be based only on the fuels? Can we just say, if we know what the fuels are, can we tell you what the fire is going to do? We wanted to look at how, you know, sort of like Mike looked at how severity differed over the whole season. <coughs> we wanted to look at how the combustion of the canopy varied by the severity. So can we predict um, how much of a fuel load reduction we had looking, or how much, uh, yeah, how much of a fuel load reduction we had by severity? And then uh, can we use spatially explicit estimates of fire severity to estimate canopy combustion? So it was in Penn State Forest, which is in New Jersey, had burned in a while. Uh, it's right there. Highlands. This is the part that's nice because these guys are talking about it. And this was the burn unit. <coughs> and I will say that if I have any nice graphs and or graphics in here, my gallery made them. Um, and so Mike already talked about this idea of burn severity. I'd love to talk about that. This was a cool graph Mike made, but. Anyway, so we use this new satellite, Worldview 3, which is basically Landsat on steroids. Uh, it has like, it's like five times the resolution of Landsat. And so instead of like a 30 meter pixel, we were using probably, I think they were like seven and a half meters by seven and a half meters with the same exact spatial characteristics of Landsat. So like Mike said, Landsat's not good for fine scale fire monitoring. This satellite is, but you have to buy the data. That's, that's the drawback. Um, so you can see the, sort of the variability. We looked at mics. All of these things are sort of different management units. This was actually a wildfire. Long story about that. Um, but all of this area burned. All of it burned. These are all plots, CBI plots, which Mike already explained to you guys. And basically, they're color coded by their rank. And where it's redder here, that's higher severity fire. The gray is lower severity fire. The green is kind of on change, right? So. Can we, this is exactly what Mike just did with Landsat data, can we predict fire severity using this worldview data? Yes, we can. We can do that. And this is what it looks like after we use various regressions to sort of, to, or there are various techniques to sort of push that data through. But you can see the fire severity for all of these burn blocks. Um, it, it's, it's pretty, I mean, it was, it was good you saw the data. This is, uh, this tech, this was published last year in International Journal of Remote Sensing. This new stuff is coming out now, sort of the difference in variability. It's kind of cool though, this wildfire you can see, some of these prescribed fires look very similar to this running wildfire, right? So it's pretty, did a pretty good job there. Um, so we talked about this too. We had before and after LIDAR in the same area, and so we have these two awesome sort of really high resolution data sets. When we put them together and so this is where that fire was. This is the, the, the wildfires up here. And then we go back a little bit. Closer. This is sort of the big reference point that I used. That was helicopter ignition. Ping pong balls. But you can see that right here. So this is pre, post. This is the difference. Uh, this is still a new thing. You can see some artifacts that we're trying to figure out how to deal with. Um, but that's the fire. And so you can see that there was they're, where these black areas are is where there's canopy consumption. And again, you're looking now at a picture of the tree heights, basically. Um, Ken showed this graph, and it's, it's a good one from another graduate student that made another awesome graph that I'm going to steal. But this is LIDAR in that unit that Ken showed uh, there before, uh, the one that was the crown fire unit. And this is sort of the pre-LIDAR with, with sort of a standard error uh, of the distribution for the whole plot before the fire and crowning fire. And then this is what it looked like afterwards. 
and then this is this another one, another example. This is the pre-fire with the black, and then the post-fire right there. So this is crowd fire. The difference between these two things is the consumption. The two examples here. This is EX1 and EX2. Both were crowd fires. So does pre-fire loading uh, predict, predict severity? It doesn't it really. I mean, maybe if you did the same prescribed fire in the same conditions, um, somehow magically, right? Uh, then things would be the same. But I mean, ignition pattern had a huge effect in this. The fuels were almost secondary. Um, I think that you kind of get this feeling that it doesn't matter how much fuel there is after a certain threshold. It's almost like you know where the, what the distribution of the fuel is is more important than where the conditions. If you have enough fuel to carry a fire at the high bearings, I don't know that it really matters that much how much you know. Like I think that that certain threshold of fuels is going to rip. It, that's what it comes down to. So no, that doesn't work. And <clears throat> and then, sort of looking at the severity classes that I showed you from the um, from the the Worldview three imagery, where we classified the severity, and then how does the fuel like within the severity? So low severity burn, how much fuel on average did we lose? Uh, high severity burn, how much fuel on average did we lose? Those kind of questions. We look at these graphs, and so before the fire. These are the severity, cl uh, severity classes on the x-axis. So this is low severity to high severity in each one of these graphs. This is before the fire, this is after the fire, and this is the difference between the two. We really only need to look at this one. Um, so you can see that like, in the canopy, and I forget what specification I had, maybe for three to eight meters or something like that, or three meters and above, you see that for the low severity classes over here, there really isn't much of a change, and there's a lot of variability. Okay? And so it's, it's really interesting as we move into the higher severity classes, you know, we're, we're losing this, that, 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 we're losing that fuel in the overstory because it's being consumed and there's less variability as well. And then the question, the, really the thing that, that I'm kind of curious about is how can we like do emissions estimates or things like that or how can we say that, you know, X fire, there was so much fuel combusted in that fire. And LIDAR data isn't available everywhere, but Landsat data is available everywhere. So could we use, can we use spectral reflectance data basically to predict uh, combustion? And these graphs, basically, that's basically what this, this graph is, is saying, is that we can do a co very coarse estimate of, of combustion using spectral reflectance data, uh, which is good, because there's not very much um, coverage with lead ladder data. Okay. So that's really, that's all I have. So I hope that wasn't too, too much at one time. OK, cool. Does anybody have a question? Like, well, I have, I guess, maybe a little bit more of a, a comment. But uh, Nick and I both talked about trying to basically, I think, retrace the steps. You know, like, uh, you go walk on the beach. Like, somebody who's good at traffic will tell you, like, this person was probably this heavy and they were running and their dog was running with them or something and they weren't walking. And uh, you can learn a lot from like the, what, what happened afterwards after the, the cause has gone from things. And, and so with fire, I think, you know, we talked a lot about trying to figure out what the, how the fire might have been behaving uh, from, from data that we collect afterwards because we have a hard time getting out there during the fire to really select what you need to do. Um, we do like we work with some modelers. And it's it's like like nobody knows how or nobody like goes out and says like well fire you know how much energy is released from fire how how does how do these things vary spatially how's fire just on a given fire like is it always like this is it is it always a little bit hot a little bit cooler is it you know what's the variability across from one fire to another um, and coming up with like estimates you know we all have our observations from experience but. Uh, coming up with numbers to represent that is something that's uh, I think people everywhere sort of struggle with. And so that's one of the outcomes of this work and, and sort of our two different approaches is trying to, uh, you know, take a, a broader scale approach um, and then, then kind of fall back in once we understand variability better. Uh, then you can kind of pick out those problems and 